So we're on to the second half of our Bs. We've already looked at blood pressure and breast cancer in the previous video. The link should be, let's try and put it here. Um, now, what have we got for our next two, Andy? Okay, so the next pair of Bs uh, are gonna be BMI or body mass index and your favorite B12 deficiency. Mm -hmm. I'd like to start with BMI and I'm gonna use it as a surrogate for obesity which is a subject I feel quite passionate about. BMI is a made up number. You calculate it by knowing your weight in kilos and then dividing that by your height in meters. Squared. I went to medical school thinking I could forget all of this maths and it keeps coming back to haunt me all the while. I can do BMI until I have to do the square and then I can't do that in my head. Absolutely. So it's quite difficult to calculate a BMI in your head because as I say, it's your weight in kilos of your height in meters squared. And therefore most of us will need a calculator for that. The normal BMI of a normal human, a slim human such as yourself is 20 to 25. If you're 25 to 30, that's considered overweight. And if you're 30 and above, that's obesity. I'm ashamed to say that my BMI is 31. This is one of the reasons I'm passionate about it because I'm a big chap and I'm clearly a little overweight. I believe your BMI is a little lower, isn't it, James? Yeah, I'm, I'm about 21 at the moment. But this is one of the problems with BMI. BMI is a broad brushstroke tool. So for example, Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he was at his biggest, he actually was technically obese, yet despite having a body fat percentage lower than mine, at about 8%. So there's always some issues with the patient that we're talking about. So we need to make sure we're dealing with the patient in front of us, not the computer numbers necessarily. Absolutely, so BMI is a crude number and it doesn't take into context your build, your stockiness, I'm quite a stocky chap, an ex-rugby player. Um, it doesn't take into account that certain races, for example, people from West Africa tend to be very stocky. It doesn't take those in, into account. Nonetheless, it's a simple number and I think everybody should know how to calculate their own BMI. If we then apply BMI to the whole population and look for people with obesity, staggeringly, in 2020, one in four people, 25% of the population are now obese. So even though BMI is a broad brushstroke tool, there is no doubt that a one in four you know, incidence shows that we have a problem. And that's why we're constantly talking about weight with patients because it has so many effects. We've already mentioned today that blood pressure and breast cancer can be affected, can be influenced by carrying excess weight. And in fact, there are 50 known conditions that are associated with obesity. So it's not just the things you've heard about, such as diabetes, blood pressure, as we said earlier, and cancer. There's lots of other things. And remember, if you're overweight, you're going to be doing a lot of pressure on your hips, your knees, your ankles, your back, and therefore hip replacements and knee replacements are heading your way in later life if you are obese. And I actually see the inverse problem of that in the GP practice quite often. A patient will have arthritis of the knee or arthritis of the hip, but they are too heavy for the operation to go ahead. Patients can be very hurt by this, but we try to explain that that's because if we put in a new joint, then that joint, that operation is going to be more difficult. It'll be harder for them to heal and recover. So again, it's not just about the long-term issues that weight can cause, but about trying to get somebody better than they are at the minute. It's not just obesity that's the problem. As I said, 25% of the population is now obese. 35% are overweight. So 60% of the British population have a weight problem. And I find that number staggering. I think it's also a problem for the, um, the mental approach to something like this. When something becomes normal, it's harder for people to see that as a problem. So rather than the, you know, the 
you're overweight, you need to do these things, and almost seeming critical. I like to look at it from the other side of things, when I've got patients who haven't liked their blood pressure tablets and wanted to come off them, and they improve their diet, or they try and do a little bit of exercise, and they change, they lower their BMI, and they feel good, and they have more energy, and they have more enjoyment of life. Rather than looking at it from that negative side of things, of this person is at risk of these issues, I try and phrase it of these are the benefits that you're likely to get and how your life can be enriched by consciously trying to shift from a morbid obesity, an obesity, an overweight category, and the benefits that come with that. What worries me even more about obesity is that it's getting worse. As I said, 60% of the population are overweight or obese, but that number was 50% in 1990, that's 30 years ago. The biggest, the most worrying problem is children or our children. Uh, and unfortunately, when you look at year six children, that's the final year of primary school, you now find that 15% of them are overweight and 20% are already obese. So we have an epidemic, both in the population as a whole and specifically in childhood. This worries me in some ways more than COVID. Now, COVID is bad, there's no doubt about that. It's been bad for us all, but COVID will go. There is a problem with an attitude to obesity that disturbs me. Patients who are obese are stigmatised in our society, in my opinion. That affects them personally, uh, emotionally, and also in terms of their occupation and their ability to advance in their occupation. When we look at an obese person, we have thoughts. Sometimes those thoughts are, I bet that person's funny, or I bet that person's jolly, or... I bet that person is lazy, so maybe they won't work very hard. So maybe we'll give the job to this other nice, slim person. And I feel that obesity is the next ism. You say that we need to get rid of obesity, and you're absolutely correct. But like COVID, it's a multifactorial disease. And I will have umpteen patients come and sit in front of me, and some of them in tears, saying, I don't eat anything and you know, I do all the exercise and I still can't lose weight. And unfortunately, there has been a huge problem with patient education. And people have connected in the past obesity with exercise and appetite. Yes, those two things are part of it, but one of the things I'm very prominent in saying to patients is not all calories are created equal. So if you eat a thousand calories of Mars bars or a thousand calories of carrots, that's going to have a very different impact on your body. And this is why it's very difficult to say, you're fat, have this diet. It probably won't work because of each person being different. And often the diet needs to be tailored to the person, whether or not that's to do with activity as well as the diet, or whether or not that's to do to the components of the diet. Some of the patients that I tend to work with a lot who have uh, weight issues, diabetics, because of how their body no longer deals with sugars, I frequently suggest diets that do not involve calories. Going back to that, not all calories are created equal. So I we help patients lose weight depending on what they need. And like dealing with breast cancer, if you have a problem with your weight and you're you know, wanting to address that, come and talk to us. We can help, but I can't help you if I don't know about it. And there's lots of things that you can do online. There's lots of self-help information. But again, one size does not fit all. So let us help you work out what you can do to maximise your own body and maximise your you know, weight and your control here. I have difficulty some ways when it comes to talking about weight because I'm a slim person. A lot of the time, as, as Andy has said, um, weight gets stigmatised. You know, that person is lazy, they have issues with appetite. I just want to highlight how appetite is not always something that is in our control. When I was on the island, I lost 14 kilos of weight. And I'm sure there's some of you saying, where is he going? He, he lost weight on TV. How does that apply to obesity? 
when I came back, I could eat two large Domino's pizzas back to back. There are other pizza brands available. Um, my stomach would be distended and uncomfortable and I would still want to eat. I have been depressed in the past. Again, I mean medically depressed. I talked to a doctor, they fixed me up, okay? And during that time, I also had an insane appetite. There are things that go on with people that affect their appetite. And as a result of being on the island, my appetite is still shafted. I have to be careful about how I eat. Yes, again, I know I am slim, but I always now have an insatiable hunger. And lots of people have different issues, whether or not it's mental health, whether or not it's biological, whether or not it's diabetes, that your effect of calories is different. We cannot say, you're overweight, do this. Every person must be looked at on their own. Talk to us and let us help if you're struggling with these things. Let's think about what a, a patient can do. Now, I know many of you out there are more like me and not like him. I've got a problem in that I'm overweight. Many of you are overweight. He is not. He doesn't know what it feels like. He hasn't felt that stigma. He hasn't felt the depression that sometimes goes with obesity. But there are things you can do to help yourself. You can talk about it for one thing. You can talk about it to your friends and family. You can go and see your GP, a GP like James. You can recognise the problem. You can calculate your own BMI. You can weigh yourself, not too frequently. I think many patients weigh themselves too frequently. And there are things you can do. As James has said, there are diets that can be recommended. They may need to be personalised. There's exercise, though so exercise is not a great way of losing weight on its own. You can also focus on your sleep. Having a poor sleep pattern tends to contribute to obesity, so there are things you can do. I don't know what you feel about things like Weight Watchers and Slimmer's World, James. Are those things that you recommend? Absolutely. Yes, Weight Watchers is brilliant. Slimming World is brilliant, as long as it works for the patient. Patients can get access to those themselves, all through their GPs, and if that works for them, absolutely champion. But it might not. And that's not a problem. I've got no issue with a patient coming and saying, I've done three things, you know, I've tried three courses, I've tried three diets, whatever, and it doesn't work. That's fine. We'll do a fourth thing and we'll do a fifth thing. There are lots of options out there and it's keeping in mind we have options and we can keep on going to help you. There's an option I think more patients should consider uh, and that is bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery basically is a phrase for a range of operations you can have on your tummy which will help you lose weight. An example is something called gastric banding where an elastic band or a large one is put at the base of the esophagus, that's the tube from your mouth to your stomach, just above the stomach. They do that at my hospital and, and many hospitals. It's a highly effective treatment and it's one of the best ways of helping patients with extreme obesity. In fact, I have a story about this. Uh, a patient of mine um, who was on dialysis and uh, I noticed that she was very obese. Uh, she was well above the 30 line, in fact was nearer 40 for her BMI. Now, she was a woman in her late 50s and normally we would consider her for a kidney transplant. I was unsure as to whether this would be a good idea, but one day I plucked up the courage to talk to her about this. And I said, Madam, would you like to be considered for a kidney transplant? And she said she would. I explained that she was very overweight. She recognised that she had tried Slimmer's World and Weight Watchers and everything else. She was a bonny child, as they say. She said that everything had failed over the years. She was embarrassed about her weight. So I explained to her that if she wanted a kidney transplant, 
really there was only one option and that was bariatric surgery which then I explained to her I went through the risks of both the bariatric surgery and the kidney transplant and she turned to me and she said Dr Steen I'm a gambler she was Scottish you see and I'll have it and she had both she had bariatric surgery it worked it took six months to work we got our weight right down and she had a transplant and that transplant is still working. So her gamble paid off for her then? Her gamble paid off, it worked. So the go home message really is, if you have either extreme obesity or moderate obesity or mild obesity, seek help, but don't forget about bariatric surgery. It is a good long-term therapy for obesity. And I don't, I'll be honest, I haven't had many patients with bariatric surgery, but those that have, have almost universally credited it with saving their lives, that they've been able to reduce, they've sometimes cured their diabetes as a result, they've been able to reduce their blood pressure medication. This can be not considered a lifestyle approach, but a life-saving approach. So no matter what your weight is, if you're worried and you're not affecting it yourself, you're not happy with your weight, talk to your doctors. Again, we are here to help. And I think that's important phrasing there. We're not here to fix your problem. We're here to help. And that might mean addressing problems you didn't know that you had or dealing with problems that you did, but it's helping overall. So please talk to us. And I think that's so far been one of the major messages on this A to Z of the NHS. Talk to us about the things you're worried about. BMI is a very personal and very sensitive topic for a lot of people. And I think you've given us a really good um, overview and quite a lot of food for thought, if you'll pardon a slightly dubious pun. With BMI out of the way, again, I hope you found some benefit and use in this video. If so, please consider subscribing to the channel and you'll get updates when the next um, uh, video is out. Speaking of which, the next one is based on B12, something that I'm particularly passionate about in the GP surgery. You can find it at the link just there. Take care.